Real quick before the video, I want to shout out Heroic Replicas. This video isn't sponsored, but they were kind enough to send me this ridiculously beautiful fully metal Hylian shield. Which, together with the Master Sword they sent to me last year, means that my childhood dream of owning Link's gear is actually real. Heroic Replicas specialise in building high quality replicas of your favourite weapons and items from games and other media, like Majora's Mask's Zora Guitar, the Goddess Sword, even the Chris Sword from the Zelda animated series. And, well, excuse me, princess. Lead time for these replicas is typically two to six months, and most of these designs will be retired this year. If you see something you've dreamed of owning, visit heroicreplicas.com. I can't recommend them enough. A few months ago, I ran through some mini-theories regarding Breath of the Wild, from where golden enemies come from to what happens after a monster dies. It was a lot of fun to make, so let's do the same again, this time not just limited to one game. Subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content, and let's run through some mini-Zelda theories. The Lost Woods act as a barrier thick, dark forest protecting Hyrule from outside invaders. Nestled between the tall, dark trees is the Kakiri Forest, a haven, a strange, magical place watched over by the guardian of the forest, the Great Deku Tree. The father of the forest protects the Kakiri, a race of childlike woodland spirits, among whom the hero of time, Link, lived until he was summoned by Navi to meet the deity. The Deku Tree announces that he's been cursed. A parasite has infested his roots, slowly killing him from within. He opens his mouth, revealing the game's first dungeon, inside the Great Deku Tree. Link must travel up through the trunk, and eventually down into the roots, where he finds and kills the parasitic Goma. This doesn't actually save the Great Deku Tree, however. He admits that, though Link's efforts to break the curse were successful, he was doomed before he started. So why would he require Link to break this curse, if his fate was already sealed? It's a common theory that this was simply a test. The Deku Tree needed Link to prove his courage, which is heavily implied by his dialogue, the time has come to test thy courage. However, like the Great Deku Tree's infested roots, I think that this theory goes deeper. Everything about the Great Deku Tree's interior is designed to test Link. Not just what could be considered natural growths of the tree, like wooden platforms and doors, but an underground water system, stone tunnels, and even revolving spiked hazards mounted on stone supports. If the Great Deku Tree's interior was designed as a test for the Hero of Time, to prove his courage and earn the Kakiri Emerald, then it seems that this plan is far older than it appears. Perhaps the Great Deku Tree was deliberately planted above these seemingly man-made chambers, and for its many long years, the deity shaped itself to create this challenge. The Great Deku Tree was entirely aware of Link's destiny, remarking that it was time for the boy without a fairy to begin his journey, so perhaps the curse laid upon the tree had been foreseen for countless years, even before it had been planted as part of the Kakiri Emerald's trial. Say you're wearing metal boots underwater. You'd sink to the bottom, right? But if you took off these metal boots and stuffed them in your pocket, you'd float to the surface. Doesn't matter that you're still carrying solid metal shoes. Makes perfect sense. The mystery of just how Link is able to cram everything but the kitchen sink into his pockets is an example of just how dumb video games are if you overthink them. Even in games which try to limit the absurdity of the mechanic that is having an inventory, it still doesn't make sense if you overthink it. It's just a game mechanic. So obviously, we're going to overthink this. With Breath of the Wild, I think there's a reasonable way to fit the mechanic into the universe. To explain how Link can carry a billion apples in the same pockets which are already filled with bows, shields, hammers, swords, but somehow never enough flint. Because, for the first time in the series, how much Link is able to carry is actually referenced. 
because he's able to upgrade his carry limit of equipment. By returning Korok Seeds to Hestu, he'll upgrade Link's weapon, shield, and bow stashes. If Hestu, a Korok, is able to increase whatever magical ability it is that allows Link to carry this many items, and knows that this is what his dances do, then this ability isn't just a game mechanic, it's part of the universe. Interestingly, for each of the dances, for upgrading weapons, bows, and shield stashes, Hestu's maracas will glow red, blue, and green, respectively. The colours of Din, Nehru, and Furore, the Golden Goddesses. So, in Breath of the Wild at least, it's possible that this game mechanic is actually an ability granted to Link, by the Koroks, by the Great Deku Tree, or perhaps even by the Golden Goddesses themselves, as the chosen hero. Other Hylians presumably can't magically store items, as some use pack animals or carts, so perhaps it isn't only a game mechanic, but an actual magical ability of Link's. Link's family is often an enigma in Zelda games. In most, Link's close family is left entirely unexplained, such as the original, Skyward Sword, Twilight Princess, or A Link Between Worlds. In others, we learn about their fate, such as Link's mother fleeing the fires of war to leave Link in the safety of the Kakiri Forest before Ocarina of Time, or the identity of the hero of the wild's father as a Hylian knight. A major exception to this is The Wind Waker, where Link not only has a younger sister, Aral, but a grandma too, a kind, caring woman who loves her grandchildren more than anything else. It's never explained what happened to Link and Aral's parents, and why they're cared for by their grandma, but there's actually the possibility that we see someone else related to Link in-game, on the bustling market town of Windfall Island. Windfall is home to a host of unique characters, but one of the most overlooked is Lenzo, the town's photographer, actually somewhat of a heartthrob for the women of the island. Lenzo gifts Link the Picto box, allowing him to take pictographs, and fittingly, the shop is littered with these snaps, images of many locations across the Great Sea. One of these is Outset Island, Link's home. If Link examines the pictograph, Lenzo will explain that he took it during his younger years, when he travelled the islands of the Great Sea. He describes the isle as the most beautiful of fishing villages, innocent and rich with nature's bounty, and that this was where he met a beautiful young lass, though she won't be as young as she used to be anymore. This is true in the Japanese, too, it's not just a liberty taken by the translation team. On Outset Island, there are three women. Sue Bell, the young granddaughter of Sturgeon who originally lived on Windfall Island, Rose, the wife of Abe and mother of two children, and Grandma. Grandma is the only elderly woman, and the only one without a partner, so it's possible that Lenzo is Link's grandfather. Lenzo's age is somewhat ambiguous. He's not made out to be as old as Grandma is, who's hunched over with grey hair, but he's definitely not young. And he's shown to have been an adventurer in his youth, travelling the Great Sea, snapping some photographs of not only mundane locations like the Cabana and Windfall Island, but the Forsaken Fortress, Ghost Ship, Choo Choo's, even, impossibly, Hyrule Castle itself. It's possibly just a throwaway line, referencing how Lenzo was something of a player in his youth, but perhaps, if Lenzo did meet a younger grandma years ago, then he passed his adventurous genes down to his grandson, Link. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers, guys, and I'll see you next time.